Let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Boy, oh boy, so much to cover, and uh, we'll see how the Lord will, will direct in this. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to read one sentence of Scripture tonight, uh, one sentence of Scripture here in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. This goes along with uh, what Brother Whiteside has been saying in Sunday school, and even in this morning, um, talking about walking in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. Verse 18, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Wait a minute, that doesn't have a period there, does it? Uh, semicolon. So I guess I said one sentence of Scripture. Let's keep going. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Uh, we see that here, uh, someone that is filled with the Spirit, a result of that is going to be singing. It's going to be music. Uh, oh, wait, there's not a period right there. Uh, verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, no period. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And uh, now you can see why Greek is so hard. That was one sentence of Scripture. You can imagine diagramming that. But uh, tremendous uh, truths here. And uh, let's pray and ask God to help us uh, tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, I thank you for this church. I thank you for uh, these faithful people. And Lord, what a blessing and a help they've been to uh, me personally. I thank you for uh, saving my soul, uh, Lord, just uh, uh, June 16th, 1986. And after hearing a message from uh, the pulpit of this church, I thank you, Lord, for uh, all that you've done in using this place in my life. And Lord, tonight, uh, I feel a little different as this is kind of a different uh, type of a message or a teaching time, but I ask, Lord, that you would direct. I really need your help in knowing what to include and, and what not to include. Help me not to waste um, these people's time. And Lord, may this be a profitable time. May we, uh, may we be motivated to love and to serve you more uh, after uh, hearing these things. Thank you, Lord, again for all that you've done for us. Lord, you are so good to us. Thank you for the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen. I have uh, two handouts here. And so if I could get uh, maybe two uh, men to come up and and uh, and hand these out to everyone. I'm not sure if we'll get to both of these. But uh, we're going to start um, with one of them here. Um, when uh, that pastor called me in February... Uh, and he says, who do I know that knows the most about music? He says, I know of Angelus Tim Schmidt. And even though he's 84 years old, I thought, you don't know many people, do you? Because uh, I can think of a whole lot of other people that know more about music than I do. And even uh, other evangelists that are better, uh, that would know more about this stuff. And he says, the history of hymnody. And as I started getting into it, I'm thinking, how in the world am I going to have enough material for two sessions? And when I was talking to Greg Murray, when Mike Pelletier and Greg Murray were here, and uh, during the revival meetings, I was talking to Mike Pell or my, uh, Greg Murray about it. He majored in music at Bob Jones, and I said, "Did you ever have a class, or you know, a time in a class that talked about the history of hymnody?" And he says, "Yes, Tim. I had five classes on it." Uh, I had five different semesters on on uh, the history of hymnody. And he says, well, you've got British hymnody, you've got German hymnody. But it just went on and on and on. He says, I don't know how you're going to confine it into two sessions. And uh, his wife says, yeah, he's got all kinds of, uh, of sermons and different things that he's done on this. And I said, oh, can I get your notes? And he says, sure, I'd be glad to send them to you. And so I emailed him, uh, or me I messaged him on Facebook about, I don't know, a couple weeks or a week after that. And uh, they were just leaving for Mexico. And so he says, he says, Brother Tim, I'll get it to you when I come back from Mexico. Well, the problem was my uh, session was just in a few weeks and he was going to be in Mexico. So I still haven't gotten any of his notes. But maybe when I get his notes, I'll have even more to expand on this. But uh, most of you, or many of you know my mom and dad, and my mom plays the piano. My dad um, doesn't know much about music, although he's uh, learned a lot the last 
uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years as he's been a song leader and even choir director. But my mom plays the piano. She knows music theory. She's been the one that knows the most about music. She uh, sung in college and trios and things like that and traveled around. And, and so uh, my mom is the music one in the family. My dad is not. And I kind of got a mixture of them both. But I remember being at home and my mom playing the piano and, and uh, sometimes we'd have other people from church come over and we would sing. And, and so I learned a lot of songs growing up. Uh, if you went over to our mom and dad's house today, you would find songbook after songbook after songbook in our home. Uh, they just, uh, music was a big part of our family and I didn't I listened to some other things uh, uh, growing up. Uh, I listened to, to different, um, I listened to country music and oldies and so on. I didn't really care so much for the Christian music. I listened to contemporary Christian music when I was in high school as well, and and, uh, and there were uh, uh, some songs that that were not good and so on. But uh, we're not going to get too much into that uh, tonight. But uh, I remember though uh, when I went to college and. Being there at Ambassador Baptist College, I got such a love for music. Um, and I, when I went to college, I thought, you know, I'm probably a one-talent guy, and I need to get another talent. I need to have something else with evangelism. And so uh, the Lord impressed upon my heart to get involved in music. So I took voice class. You don't have to try out for it. Anybody can join it. Um, and so I took voice class, and I took voice class for four years. And that really helped me. And in voice class, we were challenged to learn, uh, I think it was at least one song a week, a new one, uh, out of the hymnal. I mean, you, uh, we sang songs that were familiar tonight, but there are so many songs in our hymnal that, uh, that are so tremendous. Um, and I have gone through this, uh, when I was, uh, in Escondido, I was the song leader and, and also did the choir at a different time, uh, there, but I went through every song in this hymnal. Uh, Megan played them all out, and I uh, went through every single one, and I found some gold mine in here. I mean, there are some tremendous songs that we don't even sing, uh, that we can learn and so on. I mean, there is some, just some great songs in this hymnal. And so we were challenged to learn new hymns, and we ought to do that. We ought to learn some new songs, and, and uh, there's tremendous songs there in the hymnal. And then I started getting ambitious, and I took fundamentals of music, uh, in college, and that's the basic things, and I uh, learned a lot then, and then I got really ambitious, and I decided to double major in evangelism and music. That was kind of stupid, uh, knowing my study habits and, and my abilities, and so I took music theory, and so I took music theory, and, and I was going to try to do music theory in Greek, and uh, of course I failed, uh, well I, I took three years of Greek, only passed two of it, uh, but uh, music theory, uh, I was there at, I was on the six year plan at Ambassador Baptist College, it took me six years to graduate, and one of the reasons was because I took music theory, and I was the only one in music theory class that did not know how to play the piano. I could see it on the paper, the music, and, uh, and and know the chords and different things and the chord progressions, but I didn't know how to put it to the piano. And we had to learn uh, modulations and so on. So I would just memorize what it was on the piano. I couldn't read it from the from the the notes to the piano. And so I struggled through it. And the chairman of the music department, uh, Dr. Scoble, said, "Tim, I hear you are, you're taking music theory." And uh, and I said, "Yes, sir." And he says, "We should have talked about this." And uh, I, I'm thinking, yeah, I know. And, and uh, he says, but I hear you're doing fine. And I, and I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot. So I actually, I think that the teacher, Miss Valenta, was very gracious to me, but she passed me, and I, and I passed with a C that second semester, and I uh, actually passed music theory and learned a lot uh, about music. And I just got such a love in my heart for music. And so uh, even as I think of just being after graduation, uh, directing choirs and cantatas, uh, doing song leading, and then even uh, this year uh, in a church, we've done three choral clinics. Um, from January to March, we sang over 50 times. Uh, I don't know what we've done from April to, to June. I haven't counted yet, but uh, I, I mean, I'm sure we've sung probably 70, 80 times. Um, even last Sunday, we sang five times. So uh, you could just uh, see, you know, that God just using the music ministry. And, of course, God uh, greatly blessed me um, with a tremendous wife, and you know that, uh, with Megan, and uh, not just uh, in her ability to play the piano, so many other things as well, but the uh, Lord really blessed in that. And, and so God is using the music ministry. Um, we have actually been paid to come and, and do music uh, for different things, and so that's kind of neat as well. But 
So I think about music and how important music is. You know, music influences us more than ever before. Uh, we have uh, these iPod, uh, iPods and, and so on. Um, we're going to go to the History of Hymnody, Session 1, is uh, where you're at uh, on your notes here. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to why do we sing. Uh, we'll try to get to that. But um, the History of Hymnody, Session 1, uh, music influences us more than ever before. Uh, you know, it used to be that uh, it would take a, uh, you know, you have to go to, to maybe a, a concert to hear music. Now you've got thousands of songs just right with you, and you can listen to music, and there's so much music. You go to the stores and so on. Uh, music influences us more than ever before. Now there are over 500 references to music in Scripture. Um, I have a, a book right here that has every single uh, reference uh, of, of uh, music and scripture. And it was uh, in Genesis 4.21 is the first reference uh, of music, and then Revelation 18.22 is the last reference of scripture, uh, or of music and scripture. And then music was there in creation. Uh, music was there from the very beginning. Uh, of course, we know that uh, Lucifer, uh, the uh, Satan, was the musician in heaven. Um, he was as an instrument, and, uh, and he led the, the worship music in heaven, if you will. And so uh, music was there as there in heaven. It was there in creation. And all throughout Scripture, we find uh, music. Uh, Charles Alexander, who um, was a song leader and and uh, and and uh, was a music man for evangelist. Um, he, his wife wrote this about him: Charles Alexander loved to trace the holy use of joyful music through all God's dealings with those who have trusted Him in every age of the world's history. He loved to read and tell how David's appointed singers with instruments of music, uh, who had, uh, under the the leadership. Uh, of those who instructed about the song because uh, they were skillful and how they lifted up their voice with joy. And as they, with all Israel, accompanied the ark of God homeward uh, from the house of Obed-Edom. Uh, I remember seeing the uh, the place where that was there in Israel. Uh, he loved to, to picture the dedication, the new temple of Solomon, when the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. Uh, the rededication under Josiah when the singers and the sons of Asaph were in their place. The dedication of the wall of, of uh, Jerusalem rebuilt by the faithful efforts of Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, which was celebrated with gladness both with thanksgiving and with singing. When the singers sang so loudly and the rejoicing of men and women and children was so exuberant that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. In the New Testament, he read, and with great delight, of the songs of the angels of Bethlehem announcing the arrival of the Son of God on the earth, of the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs which rose from the gatherings of the first believers from the time that they knew that their Lord was risen from the dead, of the songs of the unconquerable faith which echoed through the old, old prison at Philippi in the darkness of midnight, of the revelation of the new song which will make the vaults of heaven ring throughout eternity, but most of all, he loved to read of the close of that long, tender con conversation between our Lord and his disciples on the eve of crucifixion, when before descending the stairs from the upper room in Jerusalem and making the way in the moonlight of the Garden of Gethsemane on the slopes of all of it, they sang a hymn together. And so that just scratches the surface of what music is in the Scriptures. There's so much uh, to be said about music and how music has influenced uh, in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. And so throughout the centuries, Christians have been singing. Uh, we don't have a lot of their songs that they sang uh, uh, back uh, uh, way back when because we didn't have a printing press. And so when Gutenberg, uh, when the Gutenberg press was invented in 1450, this enabled the print of music as well. And so they were able to, we were able to have those songs. And there are many people that influenced, uh, what we know as our hymnal today, the songs that we have, a compilation of hymns. And, uh, one of the, the, the first, uh, people that, uh, that started it was Martin Luther. Martin Luther, uh, as you may know, um, was a uh, Catholic monk, a priest, and, and uh, he uh, was reading the Scriptures and was reading through the book of Romans and found that justification, it's by faith 
alone. Uh, he's not going to be uh, justified by his works. It's going to be by faith in Jesus Christ. And Martin Luther came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and so he had a burden uh, not only to, uh, to tell others about Christ, but the, the Catholic Church at that time, and one of the negative things about Martin Luther is he never quite separated from the Catholic Church, but, uh, but the Catholic Church at that time did not want the Scriptures in the common people's hands. They didn't want it in the common people's hands, probably. Uh, maybe one reason is the same as with Martin Luther. He was reading it, and he realized the Catholic Church is wrong about so many things. And so uh, he was burdened to get the Bible into uh, their hands. So he translated uh, the Bible into the German language. And so with that same zeal to get the Bible into the homes uh, of the people, the same thing was true about music. Uh, the music was just reserved for those on the platform, for those that minister to music. Uh, it wasn't for the congregation. And so he was burdened about getting music into uh, the congregation to the, and to the homes of the people so they could teach their children, they can teach themselves and, and encourage and admonish one another with these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Um, let's see, did I, I did miss one of your blanks here. Uh, through hymns, God can speak to the people, uh, the people can speak to God, and the people can speak to one another. Uh, we have a three-way uh, fold here. And so Martin Luther was very influential in trying to get music into the homes of uh, these people. And, uh, in, 1540, in 1524, he published what we know as the first hymnal. Uh, it contained 26 texts and 16 melodies. And uh, some of these melodies were familiar tunes that the people would know because they don't have any music. Uh, they don't know music. They don't know how to read music. So the only way they can sing is from the music that they've heard. And so he uh, writes these hymn texts, and so they would sing different hymn texts to the same song, uh, to the same music. And so he uh, compiled what we know as the first hymnal. Uh, maybe some of you thought, well, this is probably going to be about the uh, the different backgrounds of stories of the songs that we sing. And uh, we won't get too much into that, but just how did all these things come about? How do we get what we know as a hymnal in our churches today is what we're talking about. And so Martin Luther was the first one uh, to do that. And, and his most famous song, uh, maybe you could guess it, it's called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Uh, you think about that song, that song uh, written, um, I think it was in 1523 uh, is when he wrote that song. And you think of all the centuries that have gone by, the thousands or millions of Christians that have sung that song uh, throughout the ages here, that, that, uh, that they have sung that song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And uh, it's a tremendous song, and it's a great encouragement to us. Uh, let's see what page number is that. If somebody could find that. Um, let's see if we can find that song. A mighty fortress is our God. Like 81. So this would be probably the, the oldest song we have in our hymnal. And you think about... Uh, when we would sing this song uh, in the congregation, it helps us and it reminds us that we have a God that, uh, as it says here, verse 1, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate and on earth is not his equal. Uh, then it talks about verse 2. Did we in our own strength confine our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side. Of course, that is Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, then the prince of darkness, grim, we tremble not for him. Uh, his rage we can't endure. Uh, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. And you're reminded of who your God is as you go through these different verses. Uh, it's a tremendous encouragement. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we have opposition in our ministry, and, and uh, there's some spiritual warfare, as I was talking about, and, and uh, even pastor might have an easier week. It might not be as intense, the spiritual warfare, but then there's other times where it is very intense. 
And we need to get our eyes back on the Lord and know that God is bigger than any circumstance. God is bigger than anything that's going on around us. And we need to remind ourselves that He is a fortress. A mighty fortress is our God. And these things can help encourage us and ought to draw us nearer to our God. And so tremendous, tremendous uh, words. And, and of course, he wrote the music there as well. Um, and a tremendous uh, song there, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Um, he uh, was burdened that other people uh, would, uh, would write music. Um, he said, music is a gift from God and not from men. It puts the devil to flight and renders man cheerful. It makes him forget anger and modesty and every vice. To it I assign the highest place after theology. He wrote to one of his friends, he says, I also wish that we had as many songs as possible in the vernacular which people could sing during Mass. But poets are wanting among us, or are not yet known. Who can compose evangelical and spiritual songs worthy to be used in the church of God? And so he was burdened that, that the people needed to get music and needed these hymns in their homes and in the churches. And so where are the people to write these songs? Of course, nowadays we have uh, so many songs. I mean, there's so many songs in our hymnal that, that we can't sing them all in a year. Uh, it, uh, it took me a while to get through that hymnal years ago. But uh, there are so many songs. Now you kind of have to find out, okay, which ones do we leave out? Which ones do we include? Uh, this one, I wish I could have given you the name of it. Uh, it's called Lucas. Uh, I'm going to try to pronounce it. Osander. Uh, Lucas is L-U-K-A-S. This is letter B. Um, Lucas, L-U-K-A-S, and his last name is O-S-I-A-N-D-R. Uh, he published an unusual hymnal in Nuremberg in 1586. Um, you see, before, it was all about just the melody, just singing unison. But he had a burden to not just sing unison, but also to break it apart into the four parts with the melody and the soprano voice. Um, and uh, you have the soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And so when he started writing these songs with those four parts, it gave just new uh, vitality in, uh, in the singing in the churches as they were starting to learn how to do the different parts. You can read a little bit about that um, underneath uh, that uh, letter B. And uh, then Paul Gerdhart, uh, we have several of his songs in our hymnal. Um, Gerdhart is G-E-R-H-A-R-D-T. Uh, he wrote 130 hymn texts, and uh, some of these uh, was, uh, was just tremendous. One of them that he wrote was Sacred Head Now Wounded. And what was going on, there was the 30-year war during his lifetime, and uh, he uh, knew of people being killed and so on. You think about uh, that song, Sacred Head Now Wounded, it just, it just brings it into to more powerful words when you think of the persecution that was going on in his day. And, uh, and so uh, here we have uh, Paul Gerdhart. There's so many people that, uh, so many hymnals that were compiled. Um, we're just kind of scratching the surface here. And then we have Isaac Watts. Uh, letter D, Isaac Watts. Uh, Watts has been called the father of English hymnody. Um, John Calvin, I'm not a Calvinist um, and uh, not a hyper-Calvinist. I'm against that as an evangelist. Um, Hyper-Calvinist churches don't use evangelist. Um, so uh, I don't get into Calvinist churches, but uh, but uh, hyper-Calvinism, John Calvin. But John Calvin, um, he had a great thought. And, uh, and I can see why he would think this, but he was firmly convinced that the only songs worthy to sing to our God was that only of Scripture. You only use Scripture. You don't use anything else, only Scripture. And, uh, and you could see that, you know, would be something that's good to do. And of course, we sing songs that, um, that are Scripture, that are just Scripture and so on. Yes, we've got them in our hymnal as well. And, uh, and there's some different songs that I've learned in school that, uh, that you can just sing right out of the Bible. And, and so that's good to do. But, uh, but Isaac Watts came along and that was the big thing that, you know, you can only sing Scripture. And Isaac Watts says, no. Uh, he says, I don't want to sing about other people's victories. I don't want to sing about what God's done for them. God's a personal God to me, and He's done things in my life, and I want to sing personal songs to Him. And so He kind of uh, changed the way right there um, as Isaac Watts uh, um, desired to uh, to have personal songs, not just those of of Scripture. 
And so Isaac Watts was tremendously influential in our hymns uh, and what we sing today. He wrote, At last and did my Savior bleed. And uh, one of my favorites, Am I a soldier of the cross? Uh, Come we that love the Lord, when I survey the wondrous cross. Isaac Watts was a, a pastor, and as he would study his messages during the week, he would actually write many of these songs to help him to convey his message. So you think about maybe what he had preached on when he wrote the song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And so he was a preacher and, and wrote these great, great texts, tremendous, uh, uh, you know, some, if anybody listened to this later on that knew about the history of him today, they'd say, Brother Tim, you are not doing Isaac Watts justice. He had such an influence in uh, what we know as our hymnal today. Uh, but we'll move on and we go to John and Charles Wesley. John and Charles Wesley, uh, they were also very influential. Uh, Charles Wesley was more prolific and influential in hymn writing. Uh, most of the songs that, uh, that we'll see of the Wesley brothers are written um, by Charles, but John, his brother, was more gifted and skillful in publishing and promoting uh, those songs. And so Charles Wesley wrote approximately 6,500 hymn texts. Uh, one of the, uh, one of our assignments in our final of music theory was to take a, a poem, to take a hymn text and write music to it. Uh, there are many songs that Charles Wesley wrote that have never had any music written to them. And so, uh, I did that and I wrote a song after a hymn text and you say, well, Brother Tim, will you sing that? Uh, will you show us that tonight? Well, you know what? It looked good on paper, but when it came to playing on the piano, it didn't sound very good. Uh, it went good for the first two measures, then after that, it just went everywhere. Um, and so I did not keep that song, it, and I think the people were gracious, because I didn't know how it, how it would sound. Uh, I was just writing these things out. So, uh, But it's amazing how many hymn texts he wrote, uh, and then these different songs that he wrote, and can it be that I should gain, Christ the Lord is risen today, hark the herald angels sing, and oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Uh, some tremendous songs that uh, that he wrote. And uh, then John Wesley, um, in one of the hymnals that they uh, published, uh, the Sacred Melody in 1761, and there were so many different songbooks and hymnals that were being published. And when these different writers would get these songs, maybe you'd find a new one. I mean, we find new ones all the time, new songs. Uh, we add it to our repertoire and so on. And and, uh, you know, you think about the hymnal, well, there's so many songs we can do, and the, the books just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, as they kept adding different songs into the hymnals that they would uh, produce. Um, he had uh, this in his uh, hymnal, The Sacred Melody, 1761. It says, learn these tunes before you learn any others. Afterwards, learn as many as you please. He says, sing them exactly as they are printed here, without altering or mending them at all. And if you have learned to sing them otherwise, unlearn it as soon as you can. And then he says, sing all. Uh, see that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. Let it not be a slight degree of weakness or weariness hinder you. If it is a cross to you, take it up and you will find it be a blessing. And oftentimes the way that we sing relates into our own uh, uh, worship of the Lord. And so uh, then he says, sing lustfully or, or sing with enthusiasm and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift your up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, uh, nor more ashamed of it being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. Uh, then he says, sing modestly. Um, do not bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation that you des destroy not the harmony. Um, then sing in tune. Our singing time, whenever time is sung, be sure to keep with it. Do not run before it, nor stay behind it, but attend close to the leading voices and move therewith exactly as you can, and take care not to sing too slow. Uh, this drawing uh, way naturally steals on all us who are lazy, and it is a high time to drive it out from among us and sing all our tunes just as quick as we did at first. Above all, sing spiritually. Uh, have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing Him more than yourself or any other creature. In order to do this, uh, attend strictly to the sense of what you sing and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound but offered to God continually so that your singing be such as the Lord will approve of here and reward you when He cometh in the clouds of heaven. 
And uh, there have been times, and I, and I think of high school, I didn't sing much in the congregation, um, and because my heart wasn't wasn't right with God, uh, I didn't enjoy the music. But as I grew in the Lord, I started loving music more, and I wanted to sing. Um, I've had a tremendous day today singing with you all. Uh, I loved the the time that we had to sing favorites, um, and I think that you did as well. I think that the singing was great tonight. Uh, and it's neat to sing these songs, and, and sometimes, and I've done it, and you've done it too, you sing a lot, uh, or you're not even really thinking about what you're singing, and it's good to be reminded, what are we really singing about? Uh, what are the words of this? Um, boy, so much can be said, but, uh, but uh, John and Charles Wesley were very influential in, uh, in developing hymns and hymnals, and then George Whitfield. Uh, I enjoyed uh, this part of the study, and there, again, there's so much that could be said, but... Uh, Revivals have had a large impact on the songs that we sing. Uh, throughout uh, the centuries, um, hymnals uh, were being updated and published because new songs were being written, and there were so many songs that were written during revivals. Uh, we have uh, many songs that were written, such as P.P. P. Bliss, who also wrote that it is well with my soul, saying, uh, wrote Man of Sorrows, what a name, sing them over again to me. Uh, he was the song leader for the prominent evangelists back in the day, uh, D.W. Whittle, and uh, even George Whitfield. He knew the uh, the value of hymn singing and continued it in all of his services. Uh, great cat crowds had gathered to hear him, and wherever he preached, there was vigorous hymn singing. And so uh, even throughout uh, uh, England, Wales, Scotland in the 1800s, uh, vigorous hymn singing accompanied these revivals and uh, the hymns of the 18th century uh, evangelical writers such as Watts, Wesley, and Newton enjoyed renewed uh, popularity. Um, the song, O oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go, was birthed during a revival. There's many songs uh, that were. And, uh, and so many of these songs that we sing today were because of revivals that had taken place in times past. Even missionaries have translated many songs into their country's languages uh, because uh, just how much it can teach and help uh, the people there in their country. And uh, there was different challenges and changes in the churches uh, throughout the last uh, 14, 400 years, 500 years. Um, the challenges and changes uh, in the churches, one, uh, as we mentioned before, was music was not uh, for the congregation, which is not biblical. Uh, the Bible tells us that we need to sing to one another. We need to sing in the congregation. Um, it is biblical for us to sing when we come to church. Uh, God wants us to do that. And then uh, we had also singing only scripture. Uh, that was another prominent thing that took place. And of course, Isaac Watts was influential in, in not just singing scripture, but other things as well. But then there came this uh, lack of musical knowledge because uh, the uh, the Puritans and thought that the instrumental music in the church was anathema. Uh, don't have any instruments in there. And when there wasn't any instruments in the church, uh, then people started getting off in their tunes. And then you had one person singing it one way, another person singing another way, another one singing another way, and then it was just a great mess of singing uh, that was going on. And so then there, there came several people that uh, that started teaching seminars on music uh, to help people to understand uh, music, how to read music, and of course trying to get the instruments back into the churches. And, uh, and so the the, uh, the piano and so on is great for us to help us to keep in tune. Uh, we were at a church a couple of uh, weeks ago that uh, have not had a piano player in well over a year. And uh, Megan was able to play the piano that uh, day. We had a favorites night. And, and I know that the people loved it so much, uh, just having something to keep them on tune, to keep them on pace and so on. And so there was a lack of musical knowledge, so that made a great uh, desire for people to understand uh, how to read music and to sing those different parts. And I think that we're kind of going back to that, uh, to what it was before, and that we're just kind of singing unison. We kind of go away from the hymnals, and, and I'm so thankful that we use the hymnal, that we have all four parts. Uh, this is my personal preference. This is not Bible. Uh, but I, uh, I like it that we have all four parts. We can sing it. I've been to places, and it's, it's their, their thing. Well, they'll put it up on the screen, but you have no music to it. Um, so you're guessing. I'm guessing. 
um, what the music might be unless I know the song. But what happens if I want to sing a part? I like to sing the bass part in, in some of the songs. And if I don't have the music there, I'm guessing, and that's not good either. So um, it's good to have the music. And so I, I kind of see a little bit of that uh, transitioning back to where we don't have a good musical knowledge of, of uh, what we're singing and, and the different uh, notes and so on. And then hymnals uh, were developed for different denominations. Because, uh, they, you know, different ones didn't want to sing about uh, what we believe is Baptist. Uh, you've got uh, Catholics that have their own hymnal. Mormons have their own hymnal. Because they, they want the songs to reflect their beliefs. And so the same thing is with us. I have not, uh, I've not been to many churches recently outside of Baptist churches, but, uh, I haven't really known of any church, any other Baptist, any church that's not Baptist that doesn't have a majesty hymnal. Um, this is a popular hymnal. Another one is, uh, from, uh, Santa Clara, uh, the, the one that they do. I've seen that in a lot of churches as well. And so we want to have songs that reflect, uh, what we believe as well. And then, uh, the value of the hymnal personally. And I don't think we're going to get to that second session, but the value of the hymnal personally, um, you know, one of the, one of my, uh, one of the things that I absolutely love <coughs> is the hymnal. Uh, it teaches you about God. Uh, we, <coughs> we were talking or we were singing just a little while ago, uh, the song, Holy, Holy, Holy. Uh, that to me uh, was one of the most majestic songs. I mean, how do you write the music? to a song about God's holiness, and yet it just fits. And I, I wonder if we're going to sing that song in heaven, uh, holy, 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 but uh, tremendous songs and things that teach us about our God, and we need to be taught about our God. We need to remind ourselves of who our God is. But then it also gives you a way to worship God personally. Um, there's, uh, there's two books. It's kind of like, it's not quite like my Bible, of course, but um, this hymnal that I have right here, um, it does not belong to the church. This one's my hymnal. Um, I bought this uh, many, many years ago, and I've got this thing marked up. I've got this hymnal marked up. This is one I used in college, Great Hymns of the Faith. And, uh, and these two books are very precious to me. Um, it's kind of like, kind of like having a Bible, because I've used this so many times with my devotions. Um, you know, like the song that we just sang, Megan and I, uh, Lord, you're all I need. Do you think I've ever sung that personally to the Lord? Yes. Yeah, I've sung that. Uh, that's a personal thing. You can take some of those things, such as um, the song we sang, He Hideth My Soul. Uh, you can make that personal. Uh, you don't have to, I mean, we're singing here, but you get alone with God, you can, instead of saying, He hideth my soul, you can say, You hideth my soul. Uh, you can make that personal. And uh, and the, the hymnal is a great way. Um, I don't know if you own a hymn or not, a hymnal or not, but we do have them in the bookstore. Uh, they're red uh, and uh, they're $15. And if you don't own a hymnal, I'd encourage you to get a hymnal. So I don't really know much about music. Well, you can take some of these songs. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, God doesn't care whether you're on key or off key. Uh, you're there in, uh, in the privacy of doing devotions. And you can just sing these songs or even just say these songs back to the Lord and uh, and worship Him and give Him worth uh, as worship is that, giving worth to Him. And uh, and so it gives you a way to worship God personally. Um, you know, one of the things that I, again, this is, a, this is a personal preference, but I really don't like the term experienced church. Uh, I really don't like that term. Uh, and it seems like that nowadays it's all about experience, experience, what can this church do for me? I'm going to feel good about the music and so on. It's all about me, me, me. Uh, and so I don't really like that uh, term, uh, you know, experience church, experience worship. Um, you know, the best experience, and I've had some good times. I had a good time tonight singing. But you know, the best experience that I've had in worship has been in my quiet time. That's the best time I've had. Uh, just singing and praising the Lord, I can get the shouting. Uh, you say, uh, "Wow, it's, uh, you know, you're pretty reserved." But sometimes I can get the shouting when I'm when I'm just privately with the Lord and and uh, singing these things to the Lord. That's the best experiences I've had. And oftentimes we don't like the hymns, we don't sing because we have a weak devotional life. We don't worship God in private, and so it's hard for us to worship Him in public. And there have been times where I've come to church and I've not enjoyed the hymn service because I didn't spend the time that I needed with the Lord or my heart's not right with God uh, or I haven't worshipped Him. Then there's other times, um, such as today, you know, I'm worshipping the Lord and, and I'm just, I'm thoroughly enjoying every song that we're singing. 
And so uh, you, when you come to church, you ought to already had your worship time. You already just go ahead and sing to the Lord and, and say these hymns back. So if you don't own a hymn, no, I'd encourage you, get it from the bookstore, $15. I think there's about four of them back there. And I want to encourage you to do that. It will help you in a tremendous way with your, work, with your walk with God personally. And uh, so it strengthens and encourages your walk with God. And it can be used to help others with whom we come in contact. You know, when I was... Um, I mean, these hymns are tremendous. When I was uh, held up at gunpoint, um, as uh, we had that home invasion years ago, uh, one of the things that God reminded me was not only of scriptures during that time, but also songs and hymns, things that we sing. And that was such a comfort and encouragement. And when we sing songs together, and it, uh, it helps to build us, just as we sang this morning, uh, different songs we're kind of singing to each other, and some songs we sing directly to God. And so music is very important to God, and it's important for our walk with the Lord. And so we need to take these songs and use them to draw us nearer to our God. Uh, so that's, let's see now, it's 735. Um, so now we'll go to the next, no, we probably won't go to the next one. Um, but uh, we'll let you be dismissed here pretty soon. Uh, the next uh, one was, why do we sing? And um, uh, I don't know, should I give you the, all these if you uh, to exalt God, to edify believers, um, to evangelize the lost, uh, maybe some of those things you can uh, you can do. Why don't you go down to why do we sing on the bottom of the page, uh, this other page? Uh, why do we sing? Um, we sing to praise. Uh, worship is an obedient response. Uh, I may give this later on next time. Maybe I'll preach or something. But uh, we sing to praise. Then it progresses. We praise to thank. Uh, we thank because we want people to remember what they did for us. Uh, then we thank to remember. And in Deuteronomy, over and over, uh, God uh, has the word remember, don't forget, don't forget, remember what I've done for you. And then, number four, we remember to trust. And, uh, and it all goes back to just as the simple song says, let's trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And so that is just a skim of what uh, this history of hymnody, there is so much more out there, uh, different people influencing uh, the uh, the hymns that we sing. And I hope that you'll have more of appreciation for your hymnal. Uh, and when you come to church, that you would be prepared to worship the Lord. Uh, there is a book that has been very helpful to me in my private time in worshiping the Lord. I need to order some of those. Um, Brother Bushy thought it was tremendous. Pastor Rogers as well. It's called How to Worship Jesus Christ. And if you've got a Kindle, uh, you know, an, uh, or an iPad, get the Kindle app, uh, look that book up. I think it's about five or six dollars or so. How to Worship Jesus Christ. Last name is Carol. That book is tremendous and it gives you practical ways of how to worship the Lord. Taking Psalms, uh, there in the scriptures as well as hymns, just as we talked about. He hideth my soul, making it personal when you sing that back to the Lord. And so singing and music is part of a spirit-filled Christian. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Let's look to the Lord in prayer.